Hi again, I want to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit. Um, there's two different um, avenues to go down as far as talking about the Holy Spirit, but let's start with John chapter 7, starting at verse 38. It says, Whoever believes in me, this is Jesus talking, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we can tell the context of that very easily. Um, the Spirit had not been given yet because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He was glorified on the cross, of course. And we know that the Bible says, Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So people had, be, had, had to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead in order to receive New Testament salvation. And he hadn't risen from the dead yet, so the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. Titus 3, 5, of course, says that we're saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So that when you get saved, when you confess Jesus as the Lord and believe in your heart, God raised, raised him from the dead, you're saved. And you are the, saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work of salvation. We see the first instance of this in John chapter 20, where it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And then way down at verse 19 of the same chapter, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, that same evening, in other words, after Jesus, it was discovered that Jesus had risen from the dead, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of, the, fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The disciples had spent the last three and a half years during Jesus' ministry already um, confessing him as Lord. And they are now they could believe that God raised Jesus from the dead because they saw him standing right in front of them. So now the two requirements for salvation were met in the disciples. So um, that's why Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, because now they were going to get born again right there on the spot. The very day Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples were born again. They met the requirements, Romans 10, 9, and they were saved. Yeah, that save, salvation was by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So they were born again on the very same day Jesus um, was discovered to have been risen from the dead. So um, then let's look a little further now and further on after this point, Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Uh, this is Luke writing, and Luke says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote to you all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Uh, and he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now hold on a second. They already were saved and they were already born again, but they were not yet baptized in the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus says, do not leave Jerusalem. This is long after that first day, that day, uh, that uh, Sunday when he appeared to them that evening and told them to receive the Holy Spirit and they were born again. This is long after that. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this point going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So at this point, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon the disciples. They were born again. We know they were saved. They had met the requirements of Romans 10, 9. They were born again. And we know that the Holy Spirit was the one who did the work because Jesus had been glorified. So the Holy Spirit had already been revealed. 
So he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus whom you have seen taken into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So this was the last thing Jesus said before he went. He just got. He just went up and uh, went back up into heaven, and the, we call it the ascension. What was the last thing he said? He said, "You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, not in you. The Holy Spirit was already in them, but when He comes on you." Verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, about a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. There present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, the 11 disciples. And all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, in verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So there was 120 people in the upper room when we get to Acts chapter 2. There was 120 people in that upper room, and that included Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was there at Pentecost, and she got baptized in the Holy Spirit along with the rest of the the apostles and the 120 believers. There was 120 that all got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So um, what is the purpose of this? He said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Well, Jesus had told them in Mark chapter 16, we read starting at verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So signs and wonders are supposed to happen to accompany the word of God, to confirm it, to confirm the word of God. God works um, through his word, and he confirms it by signs and wonders. And that has not changed. That it was true back then, and it is true today. So when so we saw that uh, he said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then on Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, now remember there's 120 believers in the upper room, and it says in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, these 120 believers. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Didn't go inside of them. It went on. It came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them. As you notice, it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Notice that they spoke in tongues and this Holy Spirit enabled them. Speaking in tongues is something that a believer can do of their own accord. It doesn't have to be, that's one of the things that we can do that's actually, uh, you know, we don't have to wait for an anointing to come for us to do it. We can speak because the Holy Spirit enables us to speak in tongues. We see a similar occurrence in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46. We see uh, the, the Gentiles getting the same experience. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. How did they know the Holy Spirit had come upon these Gentiles? Because they were speaking in tongues and praising God. Now anyone can praise God, but not everyone can speak in tongues. So how they knew was the speaking in tongues. That's how they knew the Holy Spirit had come upon these Gentiles. So the Jews and the Gentile believers both received the 
the what we call Jesus called it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Jesus said so. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They'd receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So that was the confirmation of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Um, and if you read in Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 14, it says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had uh, accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that interesting? So we see a definite separation here between the salvation work of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Salvation, these people were already believers. It says in Acts chapter 8, it tells us plainly, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. Now the Holy Spirit was inside all of them because we're saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that very plainly. So, and we know that that's accomplished by confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in your heart God raised him from the dead. That's how you're saved. So, um, so then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit this that they're talking about was the Holy Spirit upon. The Holy Spirit came upon any, it says in verse 16, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had been simply baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they had the Holy Spirit inside them. So um, you can see very plainly the two experiences, and they are obvious. There's an obvious two experiences with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is definitely a second different experience than salvation. Acts chapter 19, we see another, um, another example. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, where he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, isn't that something? Paul asked them. First of all, he wasn't sure where they were at, so he said, hey, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why would he ask that? Why would Paul ask them that if they were, if they were, um, if he thought that they were saved and there was no baptism in the Holy Spirit after you're saved? He wouldn't say that, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because he said, when you believed. Past tense, when you believed. So, here we can see Paul plainly that Paul, Peter, and John, all three of them, all three of them uh, confirm the fact that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens after a person gets saved. All three of them, Paul, Peter, and John. So if you can't, you know, if you can't accept the word of Peter, Paul, and John, you're throwing out the epistles, you're throwing out most of the New Testament if you don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because Peter... John and Paul all taught that the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit upon you, in other words, is a separate experience from salvation. They all three taught it. They all three showed examples in the book of Acts. So in, in Acts chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 38, it says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. He was preaching to the people after the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come upon them all. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all the Lord your God will call. So the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is after you get saved, obviously, that's for all. It's for everyone. It's not just for some believers and not for others. Anyone can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then there's the gift of tongues, which people get, get all mixed up and confused with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongues is talked about as a separate thing. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and believe, any believer can speak in tongues to the Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit can speak in tongues and talk to God and no man will understand him. But the gift of the Holy Spirit was exercised when? On the day of Pentecost. The gift of tongues the Bible talks about was actually exercised on the day of Pentecost and it was not regular speaking in tongues that every believer can do. Because it says, when they heard this sound in verse 6 of Acts chapter 2, it says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they said, are these not all men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? 
Well, how is that? Because it was the gift of tongues, the gift of speaking in other tongues. That's a gift of the Spirit. That's not the same uh, gift. That's not the same speaking in tongues that, that happens when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's a different thing. That's speaking in the tongue of angels. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 13? Paul said, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So he gives two instances there. If I speak in the tongues of men, number one, and angels, two. So we know that the speaking in tongues that, that is for all believers is speaking in the tongues of angels, because no man can understand you according to the, the word. We'll get to that in a minute. So uh, let's look at it a little bit further here. It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says, Now each, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. And to another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And, and uh, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. He gives them to each one just as He, the Holy Spirit, determines. Now that's speaking in different kinds of tongues. That's what happened on Pentecost. They were all speaking in different languages. The apostles were preaching the gospel in all different languages. And different people who spoke different languages understood them. It says plainly they were all understanding them in their own native language. It said in verse in Acts 2, 8, Then how is it each of us hears them in his own native language? They're all Galileans, but why are they all speaking these different languages? Because it was the gift of tongues, the gift of speaking in different kinds of tongues. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, now it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He speaks mysteries with his spirit. So what could that be talking about? That's talking about the tongue you speak in when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. It says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men. Were the, the men on, in Acts chapter 2, were they speaking to men? Yes, they were. They were speaking in men's language, not the language of angels, but the languages of men. They were speaking the language of men, which is a gift of the Spirit also. It's a gift of speaking in different kinds of tongues. So here we see that anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. When you speak in tongues, in your own prayer language, you are speaking to God. Indeed, no one understands Him. Who understood Him on the day of Pentecost when they were preaching, after they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they received the gift of speaking in different kinds of tongues? All the different people understood them in their own language. These disciples did not know those languages, yet they were speaking them. That was the gift of speaking in other tongues. So 1 Corinthians 14, 14 says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. In other words, it's something where your spirit is praying. And that's when you're... Um, and it says your spirit prays. So this is what talking about praying in tongues. This is what every believer can do this after you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because so, remember, on the day of Pentecost, all of them spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them a, uh, utterance. That was when they first got baptized in the Holy Spirit. All of them received their prayer language. And we know it's a prayer language because 1 Corinthians 14, 14 tells us so. It says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Your mind doesn't understand what you're saying. In other words, your, your spirit is praying purely straight to God without you understanding it. And 1 Corinthians 14, 2 tells us that. It says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. Who understands him? No man understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. That's talking about the same thing as 1 Corinthians 14, 14. So we see the two different um, things here. This, the gift of tongues and the... Um, and the speaking in different kinds of tongues, which is a spiritual gift, which is as the Holy Spirit um, gives it, as the Holy Spirit determines. You know, that's the Bible tells us the gifts of the Spirit are, they only happen as the Spirit determines, and He gives those gifts as they're needed, as, as He desires. That's, that's the gifts of the Spirit. Now, speaking in tongues, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The Spirit enabled them, in other words, to speak in tongues. If I want to speak in tongues right now, I can do it because it's up to me. It's, I can speak in tongues because the Holy Spirit has enabled me because I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
So now if we look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14, uh, and we just continue on after verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, in tongues in other words, but I will also pray with my mind. In other words, in English. We're supposed to pray in English too, or whatever your language is. If it's not English, whatever that is. I will sing with my spirit. In other words, you can sing in tongues. And of course, yeah, it's just, you know, when you are speaking in tongues, you can put tonality to it. You can sing in tongues. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. In other words, I'll sing words I under understand with my mind. I'll sing worship songs and sing to God in my spirit, you know. That's something you can do in your with your mind as well. You can do it both ways. You can sing with your spirit and you can sing with your mind. But then it goes on and says, if you are praising God with your spirit, notice in verse 16, it says, if you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself under those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying? So in other words, when you're singing, it says when you're praising God with your spirit is when this happens. So when you're praising God with your spirit, no one understands what you're saying, according to this. So when you're praising God with your spirit, you are speaking in tongues. Verse 16, if you're praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying? Verse 17 says, you may be giving thanks well, or well enough, one version says, but the other man is not edified. That's because it's not for speaking to other people. It's for speaking to God. Remember, the Bible tells us that you, when you speak in a, a tongue, you speak to not to men, but to God. That's when you're speaking your prayer tongue. So the Bible makes that very clear. It's very clear that, um, you know, it also says something else very interesting. It says you're giving thanks well. When you speak in your tongues, and you in, when you're praying in your tongues, when you're praising God with your tongue in your spirit, when you're singing in tongues or you're speaking in tongues, you are giving thanks well. And the Bible says you're giving thanks well. The Greek word kalos, well. You're giving thanks well. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 17. So, you know, that's a part of worship is speaking in tongues and singing in tongues. That's part of worship. That's, that's something that believers can do, and, and it's a good word. It's the only place in the New Testament that says you worship well, you, that, you, um, that you give thanks well. Giving thanks well is only attributed in the New Testament to speaking in tongues, which is interesting because, there's of course, you can give thanks well. I'm not saying you can't without speaking in tongues, but it's the only place in the New Testament that actually says that you're giving thanks well when you do this, when you speak in tongues. And of course, the Bible says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. So um, why would you forbid speaking in tongues? Because people don't understand it. People who don't haven't studied the word on, on tongues, they don't understand it and they try to forbid it. But the Bible says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. And why would it say that? Because people obviously heard it who did not understand it. So it is appropriate for other people to hear tongues if they don't understand it. The problem is doing it in a church service when people don't understand it. Doing it as, you know, people were getting up and preaching in tongues in the Corinthian church. So Paul had to address it. He said to say, well, you don't preach in tongues. These people, you know, think that, well, you know, these other people aren't spiritual if they don't understand when I'm speaking in tongues. Hold on. No man understands a man when he speaks in tongues. He's speaking to God. You're not speaking to men. You're speaking to God. That's what the Bible says. So, um, so it's inappropriate to preach in tongues to, to, uh, you know, in a service to have someone get up there and start preaching in tongues. You don't preach in tongues. Tongues is for speaking to God. It's for praising well. It's giving thanks well. It's for worship. It's for speaking to God. It's your spirit speaking to God. So um, that's what I have to say about the Holy Spirit for now. There's a lot. You could go on forever about the Holy Spirit. So this is my first of probably many videos about the Holy Spirit. So I hope you enjoyed it.